Okay, so um, it's my Twitter handle, my Facebook, my uh, the festival I'm director of. Um, thank you for the lovely presentation. Um, as, I, as was said, my name is Uri. I have a background in tech as an analyst. I'm the founder and director of the Utopia Science Fiction Festival in Tel Aviv. And I'm a science fiction evangelist. And this is a lovely um, caricature by Tom Gould live, I love. Uh, I'll be raising some ideas and asking questions in this talk. Most of the questions don't have answers yet. And some of the ideas might look absurd, and that's my perspective on good science fiction. Speculating and evoking, uh, uh, evoking us to think about tomorrow. Uh, this is what you can expect uh, if you visit or when you visit the Utopia Festival, or some of our other uh, projects, such as Designing Tomorrow, a workshop we did last year, and Cancelling the Apocalypse, that we've been doing with many collaborators. Um, first and foremost is Republica, and this would be a good time for me to refer you and urge you to check out the, uh, the Cancelling the Apocalypse programming here at this Republica conference. Now, robots ahead. Uh, the infrastructure for autonomous mobility will be laid out in the next few years. <laughs> Legislation and algorithms will determine robocar operation. There are three types of roadblocks ahead for us on the way to true and complete autonomous mobility. Technology, policy, and psychology. In this talk, I will not be addressing any technological challenges. That's for other talks. I will be addressing these five topics. The car accident, the car accident, buying your first robocar, taking a road trip, getting a speeding ticket, and the future of gratuitous honking. So let's start with the first one. I put on a funny slide, but it's not a funny topic. And we'll start with a story. You and your partner sit in a car. You're on, a, on your way to a friend's wedding. You both look fantastic. You were asked to record a short video blessing, but you forgot, so you start the um, wedding celebrations a bit early. You open up inside the car a bottle of cheap champagne, and you pour yourself two glasses and record a video selfie of yourselves toasting the newlyweds. The next five seconds will seem like an eternity. A little girl lunges onto the road ahead. She's chasing a puppy she just received for her birthday a few hours ago. It was a long and arduous struggle with her parents that was completely blown up by the grandparents. Grandparents, by the way, are standing just on the side. They're terrified and they're too slow to chase after her. People all around freeze. What will you do? Will you swerve left and hit the grandparents, swerve right and hit a tree, or stay on course and end the little girl's life much too early. Who is more important? Whose life deserves another day? So, what criteria will affect your decision? Health? Ethnicity? Religion? What if one of the people in the story is a wealthy philanthropist, a Nobel laureate, a member of parliament, a civic activist, a, prost a prostitute, Luckily, you're not required to make these decisions anymore. Their car will make them for you. Autonomous vehicles are on their way. And this is, I forgot previously, but this is the only time I'll be apologizing for this kind of pun, which you'll be hearing a lot through the talk. They've been envisioned for decades and experimented and tested for years. DARPA led technological innovation with its Grand Challenge competition uh, since 2004. Google was one of the first to present the technological marvel, but it was Tesla coupled with the uh, Israeli, mobile, uh, Israeli startup Mobileye that really got the game going, and the race is now full on. Auto companies such as Daimler, uh, BMW, GM, Nissan, Ford, Honda, and many, many more are now big, uh, have now become major names in technological trade shows. Uber has gotten into the game as well, testing autonomous taxis in a joint venture with Volvo on four North American cities, a test that was suspended uh, as of March due to the fatal accident uh, with one of its autonomous taxis in Tempe, Arizona. How would these cars navigate the brief moments of truth prior to a car accident? In 2015, car accidents took the lives of 357 Israelis, where I'm from, and 3,459 Germans. 
Worldwide, the number is 1.25 million, according to, to the World Health Organization, and obviously numerous more are injured. There's no question, this is a problem that requires solutions. Too much human potential, too many human lives are lost, and experts agree that the majority of accidents are due to human error. The case for autonomous mobility is very strong. Humans just make for lousy drivers, and we should give robots a chance. So, we make life and death decisions all the time. The ones just prior to an accident are usually hurried, even instinctive. Does it not make sense for those split seconds for an eye to take the wheel? An eye that's vastly faster than human consciousness? An eye on which we can rely to make impassioned decisions. Decisions based on the collected data that we may not fully possess. Decisions made with the benefit of algorithms that the best human minds have deliberated over, over and decided upon. Does it not make sense for that AI to make the decision between the grandparents, the little girl, and yourselves? Would that AI even exist? And is it possible that in those brief, gruesome moments, we might prefer human fallibility and impulse? In 2016, a group of researchers at the MIT Media Lab published a web game titled The Moral Machine. The title previously I, sh I, pre I previously showed. It examines exactly these questions, an updated version of the famous trolley problem. And this is how it looks like. Oop. This is how it looks like. This is how it looks like. This is how it looks like. The game sets up a situation in which uh, an autonomous vehicle loses its brakes. The player is required to decide if the robocar will remain on its intended path or swerve, presenting numerous variations on the number and type of occupants and the number of type of pedestrians the robocar might hit. The research game collected data in an effort to determine our ethical attitudes. What do we value when deciding who should live and who should die, and how different criteria matter to us? Criteria such as age, gender, contribution to society, economic status, and even our respect for the law. Did the pedestrians cross the street on a green or red light? The team even examined how much we care about body type, slim versus obese, and our um, attitude towards animals and pets. We hear, who here played the game? Well, I urge you, it's still online. Um, the game went viral. Um, the few here are not alone. Three million people played it all over the world, um, and they've uh, played 40 million different variations, different scenarios. And what can be deduced from the data MIT collected? Well, MIT shares that. Generally, we value women over men. We value babies over the elderly. We prefer saving people with a proven record of contribution to society and respect for the law, and we prefer humans to animals. The team also shares that they see specific trends emerging from different locations. Players under different regimes relate differently to the dilemmas presented in the um, moral machine game. In Western bloc nations, there's a tendency to place, on average, less importance on prioritizing passengers over pedestrians and greater priority on minimizing overall loss of life um, compared to players from what's considered Eastern Bloc countries. Now that we've gotten that sorted out, the trolley problem, let's move on to buying your first robocar. Now, when getting to the question of buying one myself, my chief concern would be, would it turn into a huge robot from outer space? Preferably, yes. But I understand other people may have other concerns. Uh, for a company, for car companies, there's a factor that stands above the moral decisions uh, to be made by the robocar, and that is, how likely are we to buy a robocar, and how likely are we to buy their robocar? For example, Daimler. Daimler had said that their autonomous cars will prioritize the life of passengers over others. 
In an interview last year, Christoph von Hugo, head of active safety for Mercedes, for Mercedes, said this. You could sacrifice the car, you could. But then the people you've saved initially, you don't know ha what happens to them after that in situations that are often very complex. So you save the ones you know you can save. If you know you can save at least one person, at least save that one. Save the one in the car. Now, people engage with the moral machine dilemmas differently according to their perspective. Are they detached from the incident or are they inside the car? It's no surprise that um, most people want autonomous cars that will um, radically reduce the number of car accidents. But they also, at the same time, want cars that will first and foremost safeguard their own lives when they are occupying them. So, Mercedes, Daimler's announcement is completely understandable, but basing the robocar algorithms on their marketability and the selfish nature of their would-be passengers, occupants, might not lead to the safer driving environments that we all aspire to have. Further, according to Daimler, vehicle ownership allows for a certain immunity, a priority in the life and death algorithms. Shouldn't the opposite be the case? Assuming ample, transporta uh, ample public transportation options, isn't ownership of a private vehicle a burden on society? Wouldn't the privilege associated with ownership require an added risk? The answer isn't clear because we're not sure yet about the business model for autonomous mobility. Many experts claim that individual, personal car ownership is a thing of the past and that the future belongs to public transport and communal rideshare apps, services. The next stage in the evolution of uh, apps like Uber and Lyft. But even taking all that into account, one has to factor in pedestrians, because be it public transport, taxis, rideshare services, and private cars, pedestrians are victims of car accidents, autonomous or not. And, or, but, they did not make the conscious decision of stepping into a large and heavy machine that can travel at lethal velocities and might hurt them. Let's get out of the city. Let's try and take a road trip. Nowadays, a British national can purchase an American Harley Davidson motorcycle, for some the symbol of freedom and individuality, and drive all the way from uh, Scotland, from Edinburgh, to Hong Kong. He'll be passing through different nations, different cultures, different sceneries, different languages, and different regulatory regimes. How would this same trip look like with a futuristic autonomous Tesla, much like the Harley, now an American iconic brand? How would different models by different companies, manufacturers, manufacturers manufactured under different regulatory regimes, handle this, operate in this scenario? How would insurers, rental agencies, and not to mention tra traffic police react? Would the robocar tell you when crossing from the EU to Russia? You have entered a new ethical regulatory regime. New operational directives have been implemented and now apply. Please confirm. Please confirm. Please confirm. Global implementation of autonomous mobility will demand a major overhaul of national regulatory systems and transnational treaties. In normal times, this would be an enormous feat, and we are not in, in, in normal times when it comes to international collaboration. The transition to global autonomous mobility will take more than a few years. These are only some of the complexities, challenges, difficulties, uh, that box in the industry, much like they box in the robocars themselves. True autonomous mobility, in the near future at least, will most probably be designated and implemented in urban centers as taxis and public transportation, with the long-range exceptions of autonomous buses, uh, if you think about it, single-cart uh, trains on asphalt roads, and autonomous trucks and delivery services. To sum up this first section, there are a few roadblocks ahead. Let's move on to a few more roadblocks, like getting a speeding ticket. How many here have ever 
driven past the speed limit? Raise your hands. Keep your hands up. How many have done an illegal U-turn? Okay. How many got caught? <laughs> As I understand it, an, um, an autonomous vehicle can derive its operation from two distinct systems, the law and human mimicry. Mimicking, mimicking other vehicles on the road based on the data that's being collected over the past few years and as we speak. These two systems clash. In some cases, driving a car at 10% below the speed limit might seem like a sound and safe strategy. Might, it, but it might be dangerous for the car occupants and the cars around it if most cars drive at 20 to 30% above the speed limit. As a result of poor city planning, a, an illegal U-turn might be so popular it would show up on uh, navigation apps. And of course, avoiding a, a car accident might necessitate committing a traffic violation. How we treat and relate to traffic laws change from city to city, between ur urban and rural environments, between different cultures, countries, and even our personal moods. At some point, determinations would be needed and will be made. Should the autonomous vehicle mimic other vehicles on the road, or should it obey the law? This, the answer to this question, and the questions that arise from it, will determine who gets the speeding ticket of tomorrow. This is the liability question, and it's a quaint dilemma in the, in, the, in the world of autonomous mobility, but I'd like to highlight a more philosophical dilemma hiding behind, just behind it. How much do we actually obey traffic laws? How much do the traffic laws suit and conform to traffic realities? Are there traffic laws that are redundant or that encumber traffic instead of regulating and facilitating traffic efficiently? Are there not traffic laws that might be doing more harm than good? Would we want to keep our personal freedom to obey traffic laws or to object and disobey them? And maybe some of you already kind of think about what I'm going to do next. Let's think about this word traffic. What happens when we delete it from the paragraph? So the speeding ticket of the future is not just a question of responsibility and liability, it's a question of agency. Would we retain the possibility to break the law and get a ticket? And if we choose not to, what would that mean? People, as I've, become, if, as I've come to know them over the last 38 years of my existence, uh, they have a tendency to flaunt authority and defy the law and do mischief. What are the speeding tickets of tomorrow? Autonomous vehicles, I hope you recognize my friend over there. But autonomous vehicles are just a part of a larger array of AI technologies that are rapidly insinuating themselves into society. We've talked about mobility, let's talk about freedom. How much freedom do we want to retain versus algorithms that serve not only commercial interests, but our systems of governance and justice? I've promised gratuitous honking, let's talk a little bit about driving culture and gratuitous honking. With the car and car ownership come social contexts and cultural codes that go much, much, much beyond going from work to home to your friend's wedding. Here's a little taste. There's going to be sound now. America got right. Cars and freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and all I had to do was Google cars and freedom. And, um, <laughs> the car is a symbol. Uh, it's, it's a symbol that has formed over decades, and it will take decades to transform. 
Driving culture has a huge impact on our physical surroundings. Urban environments the most. Uh, where we've already ascertained, or I've presented my, um, my argument that autonomous mobility will probably be implemented first. Um, to convey how much car, cars define urban environments, let's have a look at a city without any cars. Here's a little video of a city, my city, Tel Aviv, my hometown, on a day without cars around. This isn't Earth Day or some other green municipal initiative. This is the Jewish Day of Atonement. It's a religious holiday, um, whereupon it is customary, not mandatory. There's no law, no regulation, no city ordinance. It's just customary not to drive. From sunset to sunset, through a night and a day, no one drives. This doesn't happen in one specific neighborhood, like it did last night here in Berlin, when we wanted to get some Korean barbecue and ended up stranded in the middle of Kreuzberg, thank you. It's the entire country. This is how it looks like, this is how it sounds, and there is sound, very, very quiet though, and this is how it feels. A major part of a city's atmosphere, its personality, if you will, has to do with the flow of people through it, its traffic patterns, its transportation options, its driving culture. It's what makes some of these cities so recognizable. The planning of autonomous mobility is intertwined with the planning of the future of our cities, where more and more, I'm sure most of you know, people live every day. I think it's 54% of humanity as of 2015, and according to UN um, forecast, it should be 66% by 2050. Will autonomous mobility be oriented towards public or private mobility? Will it focus on individual or communal needs for transportation? Will our cities retain different spaces, different hubs for work, living, recreation, socialization, that we travel back and forth and, um, and in between from? And how would autonomous mobility affect this? How would autonomous mobility planning affect different neighborhoods? And how will it affect the very nature of what a neighborhood is? When you look at these concept designs by a few major car companies, what do you think their answers to those questions might be? Who is the car intended to serve? What is it designed to be and to do? These and many other questions are not yes, no, or good, bad questions. They're questions of policy and even more so questions of identity. Different cities and different societies will figure out different questions for themselves, different answers, sorry, for themselves. And I did promise gratuitous honking, so this is a short clip from the 1969 heist film, The Italian Job, starring Michael Caine. The entire heist revolves around creating a huge traffic jam in the middle of Turin. So, a few clichés aside, it's a pretty good film. It has a pretty good 2003 remake with a traffic jam in Los Angeles. What would be the Italian job remake of 2038? And I'll also ask you if in 20 years' time, when I return from Republica 38 to my, in my inner robo-taxi from the airport to my Tel Aviv apartment, which I'll still be renting, will the first thing I notice still be the gratuitous honking? even though no one will be behind the non-existing wheel, because the robotaxi has learned and retained the driving culture around it? Maybe it's just an older model. The physical and regulatory infrastructure of our current mobility was laid out about a century ago, with the ability to move exceedingly faster from place to place. As a society, we've agreed on certain risks, even certain sacrifices which now amount to millions of injuries and fatalities annually. Each of those is an enormous human tragedy. We're on the verge of a revolution that has the potential to dramatically change mobility, and much more than that. The potential for, transfer, for safer transportation is clear, and the need for it is undeniable. What we need to make sure is we arrive at that potential and that we cause as little collateral damage as possible. I had three goals in this talk. One, 
highlight some of the roadblocks ahead, highlight the, highlight the serious and complex dilemmas. I've mentioned but a few, and there are many, many more. I've not even touched surveillance and hacking. Autonomous mobility is not just around the corner. Secondly, call for public discussion. No better place to do that than in Republica. A call for public discussion between all stakeholders. The dilemmas require creative, thoughtful, and these are human beings, human lives. They require kind solutions and kind debate. These debates can't happen only within the confines of the innovation centers of the auto industry or in academic think tanks. Although it's fantastic that they're happening there, they should be transparent and they should be um, engaged with the public. And last but not least, I would like to urge all of us, urge you to speculate about the speeding ticket of tomorrow. As I said, my personal preference are for um, uh, vehicles that turn into giant robots, but for the future, I would also like flying cars. But that's my personal preference. I wanted to arouse you with a few speculative ideas through this talk, some of which might seem absurd. We have to continually speculate on what might be, both to deter ourselves from unwanted futures, but also, and this is much harder, much, much harder, to lay a conceptual framework for actual desirable futures. I usually end uh, science fiction talks with this wonderful um, quote by Frederick Pohl. Um, a good science fiction story should be able to predict not the automobile, but the traffic jam, and it's so f it fits here so well. I ask you, what would be the speeding tickets of tomorrow? I'll be thanking Sohan D'Souza from the MIT Media Lab, Brad Templeton and Lee Orr for assisting with this, me, with this talk. And I'll thank you as well for being such a patient audience. Thank you.